Hello, and welcome to, if you're watching, Varm Vlog. If you're listening, Varm Vlog and Regrettable Century. Uh, <laughs> um, this is not a No Royal World episode, however. This is just another joint episode. And we are talking today about warm and cold Marxism, which is a phrase which I think is really the warm and cold streams of Marxism, which is right. a phrase that I got from you guys. And I wanted to talk to you about because I've been wrestling uh, in my head with different conceptions of revolution and, and different conceptions of what Marxism is for about, I don't know, 15 fucking years at this point. And I've been going back and forth about the critique of economism and the critique of political determinism, which to me, are the two vices. And I say political determinism as opposed to voluntarism because both have deterministic and voluntaristic threads within them. And when yeah. I heard you guys talk about the hot and cold stream, I started to see sort of a way out of this binary, a sublation, if you will. Yeah. Um, uh, because there's also a different but aligned binary when we talk about Marxism, and that is humanistic or Hegelian Marxism, um, although not all he humanistic Marxism is actually Hegelian, which is confusing. Um, and there's also Marxist humanism with a hyphen, which is its own special thing. Um, and scientific Marxism, which is sometimes Hegelian <laughs> and sometimes structural. Um, but... All these things seem to be kind of confused um, historically when we think about them. And the warm and cold uh, stream metaphor for me was useful because it is both it is both fuzzy enough that we can kind of use it to pick apart different elements in all these things in ways these kind of hard binaries don't really allow us to do, but also speaks to two different tendencies often within these kind of poles of Marxism. And so so I wanted to to pick your you guys' brain on that and how we can use that to understand the current moment. And this will be leading into a different episode that we will do probably in a couple months about how both these streams are headed off of a waterfall into <laughs> the ocean. But <laughs> um <laughs> so uh uh, it's I, I think it's always funny that the uh, white guy Wednesday on TIR was always called the you know like Anglo pessimist power hour, which was funny because none of us are wasps at all. Yeah, um, <laughs> not even a little bit. Like it's like uh, one Polish dude, uh, uh, a half a half uh, Bulgarian, half Scotch Irish uh, Jew, and um, a Kurd. Like I don't know, but um, also. They're not as pessimistic, even with me there, as we are together. So yeah. that should be taken as a warning for those of you who want your revolutionary optimism, uh, or what I like to call stupidity. Um, <laughs> so cowardice, not your blind is... optimism, anyways. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you, you, your optimism, just like your pessimism, must be dialectical or right. not at all. Yeah, right, because both the warm and the cold stream are they're based on some objectively actual foundations. Yes. It's just that to, to pick one or the other is to be either be determinist or voluntarist, and either way is to be hopelessly optimistic. Right. And, and one thing I've learned from your discussions of warm and cold that I've seen in myself is like the determinist will be hyper-deterministic until it's convenient for them not to and then become hyper-voluntarist. Mm -hmm. And the voluntarist will be hyper-voluntarist until they lose and then they will be hyper determinist. Right. Um, That's because they're both uh, uh, in integrated fully into what Marxism is as a philosophy. So you can't really ever separate it completely. I mean, I consider this. I've, I've been. You guys have been reading just so for some context of people who want to pick up our readings. That's informing this conversation. I've been reading the kind of, I guess, post Marxist. It's hard to figure out what Alvin Guldner actually ended up. Um, cause he dies while he's finishing his last book, which is the two Marxism, which is a, which is a attempt to do meta Marxism, which is to apply Marxism to itself and figure out and to be theoretically rigorous and figure out where the contradictions are and what they lead to. 
um, within Marxism, both as a theoretical practice and as an actually existing um, political tradition. And so that's in the back of my head. And you guys are reading Enzo Traverso, one of my favorite Marxist scholars, but you're reading a book by him, who I, which I haven't read. It's really um, good. Yeah. Um, it keeps getting better. Every chapter that we go over is even better than the last one. In yeah, fact, I, think, I, I would consider the latest chapter that we read to be a critical reading for all leftists yeah. of, of every kind. The book is called Revolution and Intellectual History. Yeah, uh, which which I think uh, I've started reading because you guys are reading it. Um, I just haven't finished it yet. I, I'm now I'm just got through my chapter on trains. Um, <laughs> that that <laughs> so one I was like, chapter rules. It, it was a good chapter, but I was like. God, I hope it gets better than this. <laughs> it, was, no, it was fine, but it wasn't like Traverso caliber material in my opinion. Uh, I, well, to me, it's a sleep that it's a sleeper sale to get your materialism, like your like yeah. vulgar materialism, almost in before we get into, yeah, uh, you know, stuff like symbolic bodies or whatever. What I'm gathering is that book is written kind of dialectically. Um, yeah, and the reason why this is actually informing me about this and we'll talk about this material basis here but i think both these books and i'll throw another book that we've all read here but maybe our audiences haven't read and we haven't talked about it in many years so russell J uh jacoby's dialectic of defeat right um excellent, excellent book yeah all together as kind of context for this conversation where there are all kinds of contradictions and anomalies that emerge in marxism but they actually are based both on historical events that actually really happened and on the theory. And the one thing Guldner and I don't know, have you guys read two Marxisms? I haven't. Uh, no, actually you should, haven't. I'll, uh, I will get you a copy because yeah. um, right. it's actually hard to get now. It, it's out of print. Um, the, the, the one thing Guldner emphasizes that makes Marxism unique, both compared to other forms of radical politics and to the major politics of its day, and he's writing in 1980, um, is that Marxism really is theoretically focused in practice, even in its actual practice, in a way that liberalism our conservatism our fascism or whatever are not although fascism is a little closer sometimes um whereas like those the liberalism is a cluster uh, it's like a family relationship of things get all bit constantian against it and you can't really define it, it but you can see how it moves um whereas you, you know in american politics for example um everything is liberal and nothing is liberal like yeah. Um, but whereas Marxism really is theoretically quite precise because it's a critique of both actually existing capitalism and the socialism and, and proto-communism of its development and day. And so it's informed by that, but that doesn't actually mean that it ends up being purely theoretically coherent, I think. And that's, yeah, right. that's where these warm and cold stream stuff kind of really got to me because I was like, oh, now we have a way to talk about these two emergent tendencies. Because someone, for example, I, I think another thing that happened the same day I was listening to you guys talk about warm and cold stream was a friend of mine asked me, is Marxism, what is Marx's take on free will? And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> like, it depends what, on what on what year you're asking yeah you know what year are you asking and also how are you asking it because marx clearly doesn't believe in counter causal free will but he does sort of believe in human agency most of the time but sometimes it sounds like he doesn't like um so that sort of gets you into into the kind of problem at hand and i don't want to it's not because marx is is a is a terribly inconsistent thinker i actually think he's trying to be a consistent thinker which leads him in radically different and sometimes radically opposed directions yeah and um so to, to bring that back it's good to start with marx but i also think we have to like talk about marxism as a tradition larger than just marx or marxology um, yeah definitely well because like you know like you were just saying marx was trying to be a consistent thinker within the communist movement and then later on, there are people who are trying to make Marxism into a thing and make it consistent. And that's a different project. Right. Absolutely. So 
what what before we go because i haven't defined warm and cold stream for our listeners because i don't i didn't use the terminology before you guys so i'm gonna let you do it what are the warm and cold streams where did you get this this uh kind of metaphor from well it comes from ernst block and uh in the principle of hope i think he really lays down what it is and uh for for him the warm stream like we previously mentioned is the uh the more humanist sort of uh tending towards basically uh drawing a lot of inspiration from from early marx and his uh discussions of alienation and his sort of uh borderline romanticization of pre-capitalist modes of production what gets later called like humanist marxism or right. yeah, marxism. yeah right yeah and then cold stream would be the plakhanov kautsky stalin of course it's there's a myriad of different offshoots of this but the very deterministic sort of scientistic route that marxism is that can take and does which actually in uh, in our opinion, becomes the main way of thinking about the world by Marxists uh, after with with the triumph of the Soviet Union, basically. Yeah, well, and even before, because like uh, yeah, probably yeah, you're right. Like, yeah, yeah. Like Otto Bauer in his uh, seminal work about nationalities and social democracy, he's heavily criticized by like Rosa Luxemburg and Kautsky and Lenin, and I would say he's criticized by very very cold stream kind of thinking yeah right even though luxembourg is in general a warm stream thinker yeah right. exactly. like um so one of the things about this though it, then one of the reasons why i think this is a good metaphor for what's going on here as opposed to the what's commonly used which is western or eastern marxism right not accurate which is yeah, not accurate can, at all. Yeah, like who's Luka, Lunacharsky then? Yeah, right? Lukash, he's not from the West. Exactly. Yeah. Well, Lukash is both. Well, yeah, yeah. also Lukash yeah. is both. Lukash is both on the warm. Year. Yeah, depending on the year. Yeah. Um, and Altusair is from the West, but he's definitely most of the time curl stream, except when he isn't, um, which he has to come up with like a bizarre form of physics metaphors to justify. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can turn the tap on or off depending on, you know. Right. <laughs> I mean, and that's why it's a better way to think about it because in most of these figures of movements, like, okay, we, we have scientific socialism and Hegelian socialism. And one of the things that uh, Alvin Goldner brings up is we always treat those as like ant antithesis, but he points out that like Lukash and Althusser actually often say the same thing. Right. Well, uh, they, how like... they got there was completely different, right. but their conclusions are similar. Yeah. Um, and and that's something to really kind of play out. And I think for me, that was an indication that a lot of the super focus on like, well, we have the right methodology. This is the science of socialism starts to fall apart when you start looking at like, well, how do these groups that have opposed methodologies within the Marxist tradition end up at similar conclusions? And conversely, groups that have the same methodology uh, and also claim to be, you know, in the spirit of scientific socialism, uh, end up at diametrically opposed conclusions. And this this was hinted in uh, our discussion of American Trotskyism, but like it, it, you see this in general, it comes up over and over again. Um, and and it is not just a Western phenomenon either. And I think that's important to talk about. I think we see this in Chinese Marxism too. Um, I mean. And, and you want to talk about seeing in the same person, Mao is all over the place if we use this kind of metaphor. Sure, right? Lin yeah. Lenin was all over the place too. And also, so is Trotsky. And actually, one of my favorite examples of the, the way that there's not like a, a good side and a bad side necessarily is like Stalin and Trotsky are both uh, principal figures of what would be called, what I would consider to be cold stream Marxism. There's no right. warm stream between them. And they're diametrically opposed, despite the fact that they probably would have pursued a similar route. Yeah, I was going to say, they, they actually, their policies are, their policies for the Soviet Union uh, are largely similar, actually. Their yeah. policies towards the party are different. Um, and Trotsky gets more democratic as he gets older. 
Well, um, I mean, when it doesn't matter. <laughs> right? Yeah. Right. Um, After he banned, supported banning factions. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, sorry, Trotskyus. Yeah. There's also a whole lot of like center and left opposition who were not Trotskyist who supported the removal of Trotsky from the party who ended up getting yep. purged too. So, I mean, like, all this ends up being pretty uh, tenuous. Yeah. But I think. Everyone fucked up. I'll say that. Yeah, uh, it, yeah. it goes back. It goes back to the in my the the original sin of Bolshevism that le that leads to Stalinism is the ban on faction. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So, and I, I think we also have to talk about like Stalin is a very cold stream figure. Yeah, Stalinism in its formal inclinations is very cold stream in its theory. Mm -hmm. But Stalinism in practice is fucking hyper voluntarist as fuck. Like Marxist Absolutely. Leninism is Absolutely. it tends to be extremely voluntaristic uh, when it's actually attempting something because the whole premise is actually in some ways spiting Plakhanov. <laughs> like, well, um, on top of on top of like uh, just the uh, with the, the 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 German invasion of the Soviet Union comes the activation of like a dormant Sorelian strand within Stalinism to, to rally the people with voluntaristic feats of strength and defiance and uh, reincorporating religion and great Russian patriotism uh, into uh, the official ideology of the state. So it's well, like, and like extolling the virtues of the, like holy black soil of mother yeah. Russia, you know, like, yeah, yeah, it's it's real warm stream stuff, but so warm that most Marxists won't touch it. It's too warm. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like the boiling water that you pour on the tea bag, but you just yeah. try to drink it. <laughs> well, because because that's if there's ever any, and before people get on there, I'm not equating Marxist Leninism to fascism. They're radically different things. Absolutely. Um, but if there's ever any, uh truth to the comparison where you can find weird things that are actually comparative it is not totalitarianism whatever the fuck that means yeah. it is this is like fake, <laughs> fake, it fake is, thing it, it's an interesting thing because i mean we could get into lukash and totality i actually did find that like people who say that it was invented by anti-marxist like hanta Arendt, i actually found it being used by marxist in the 20s Oh really? Uh, well, I yeah. know it's, it's used by Mussolini to. It's used to by describe, Victor Serge too. It's yeah, used by Mussolini yeah. to describe the Italian state, which, by any definition of totalitarianism, is not accurate. Right. Right. The guy is an aspiration. Yeah, aspirational more than anything else. Right. I, I was actually uh, Victor Serge is my uh, Victor Serge is one of the early places I find it, but I find it early. I find yeah. it earlier than you're supposed to. Like right. And then Draper talks about discussions around it in the in the mid forties. Right, but the, the, the definition Marxist, everyone uses. Who's the Dutch uh, Marxist? Who's like a critic of Lenin? I don't remember. Uh, Panikuk. I think I think as as early as like nineteen nineteen or nineteen twenty, he's even using something like totalitarianism. Right. Maybe I don't remember that, but I don't think he uses that word. But maybe not. But the, the the thing is, though, where I agree with you is our definition of it comes from like 40s and 50s anti anti communism, and right. yeah. the uh, that's the, the one that I think is fake, right? Um, well, I mean, I can I kind of think they all don't work actually mm -hmm. because none of it, like one of the things that I will say when we talk about Stalinism is we attribute too much to Stalin and we don't attribute enough to uh, material conditions. And in yeah, a way, like, like thousands of other party members, yeah, also. And, and like all these social antagonisms, many of which had nothing to do with socialism whatsoever, are even the unleashed in a revolution. And we should expect that, by the way, right. like that's something we should, like, you kind of have to control. And it's interesting, one of the critiques that I make of Stalin during the control, I mean, during the purges, during the years of is he didn't have enough control of elements of the society oh absolutely like, like it was the it was basically pushed by stalin and then the centrifugal force of it got way out of control and they actually had to crack down on it because it was 
the the bloodletting was uh, so insane that the the party leadership started to become concerned about it. Right. And and interestingly here again these you want to talk about the turning on the taps. What we see here is very cold stream analysis like like Stalin has quotas cuz he figures there must be just certain amount of people and Yeah. But it unleashes these forces that he he absolutely is not in charge of. Mm -hmm. And uh and it's interesting to me because actually some of the best writing on this comes out of the Chinese. Like there's this weird, you know, there's this weird, like Stalin is good, but not really. He also fucked up tradition and, and Marxist Leninism in China. That is actually like not part of, uh, it's a very strange thing because they also accuse like Khrushchev of historical nihilism. So it's like, right. but we can't talk too much about how he fucked up. Like that's the Chinese that's stamp. A 60 40 thing. He's yeah. Kind Stalin of. is 60% good and 40% bad. Bad. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and like the Sino Soviet split actually goes back to Stalin, but we can't say that because, like, um, <laughs> uh, but anyway, to, 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 to kind of, th that's interesting because some of the better critiques of Stalin's lack of control come out of China. Right. Um, the, what what is interesting about that though is in the case of, of the Soviet Union you see both run amok kind of opportunistically mm -hmm. um and that's and you see this also in defenders like if today if you read someone like Paul Cockshot or um or uh when he was alive Domenico Lacerdo who like I mean, Lacerdo's definitely a Hegelian. And again, this makes the whole Hegelian versus structural argument kind of horseshit because a lot of the Hegelian Marxists are also in this cold stream in the extreme. Mm -hmm. um, where well, Lukash is both and yeah. a Hegelian in both instances. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I remember when we were reading Russell J J Jacobi's uh, Dialectic of the Feet. Um, and like Jack B can't figure out what to do with Lukash. <laughs> like, yeah. like, is he a Western Marxist or not? <laughs> yeah. Like uh, he, uh, he also caused some people wrong to like, like, like uh, Sartre is a Western Marxist, but like the idea that the Western Marxists, he has this idea that the Western Marxists are mostly descendants of the left opposition in Germany. And I'm like, well, uh, Sartre is a Maoist buddy. Like, um, <laughs> so I mean, uh, Sartre is definitely a Maoist by the end, and even by the like the last couple two decades of his life. But he actually starts in the orbit of Trotskyism. Whatever for whatever that's worth, it's just it's just to say that like too precise a definition actually makes this impossible to have a discussion about. Right, he takes well, that, the French path. Right, start off Trotskyist, end up Maoist. <laughs> yeah, that is the French path, actually. Yeah, which is interesting. Uh, uh, as opposed to start off malice to end up right winger, which also happens in France. Right. Um, in Italy too. You, yeah. You, of, you know, the neo-Nazi Maoists in Italy, right? Yes, I do. <laughs> um, what the it, fuck? Just like there's, there, there is a very tiny group of people in the United States who, who like Mao, who will argue that the Confederacy was a national revolution. <laughs> yeah, um, sure. Uh, That's a discussion I would definitely love to never have. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's interesting because a, a, a Maoist friend of mine once said, "Be careful about national Bolshevism. It's actually a, it's actually a, a tendency in Maoism that people don't see because it's not white." And it yeah. was it, it was a non-white Maoist who told me this. Like, all I had to do was read about what national Bolshevism was one time, and I'm like. Oh, like Maoism. <laughs> sometimes, like Maoism, sometimes. Let's be like fair. Maoism, Maoism, like Maoism is a highly, like, of the forms of Marxist Leninism. And there's a book I have back here who talks about one of the appeals. And this is gone now because the Soviet Union doesn't exist. But one of the appeals right. of Maoism is the same, is actually similar to the appeal of Trotskyism, is that when, uh, when detente pushed there's this encouragement first from Khrushchev, but it gets actually worse after Khrushchev. It's, it's, it's worse periods actually in the Brezhnevian period during the period of soft Neo-Stalinism, which is, which is kind of funny. 
Yeah. Um, but where the 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 under the guise of the popular front, again, also from Stalin, guys, you can't mm -hmm. you, you can't pretend that like third periodism is the only thing that Stalin ever did. Yeah. Um pushed a lot of the communist parties in Latin America and Europe to be to the right of the socialist parties. Right. Yep. They they so, passed each other going in opposite directions in right. the nineteen thirties. <laughs> right. So well, you know, particularly in places where neither were in control. Now where where so where the social democratic parties have power, they tend to just go Keynesian. Right. So, um, but but you see this in like Latin America. Like you look at like some positions taken by the communist parties, by the by the common turn line communist parties, and then you see a double response. One is the socialist response, which actually often goes to the left of them, and then the other is a Maoist or Graverist response. Now, Graverism doesn't really exist outside of Latin America, so mm -hmm. so that's not an option for most people. There's not a lot of Graverist in Europe, which I actually find interesting that that never happened. That a whole another debate I'd like to probe is why weren't there Graverist in Europe? But anyway, the people who there's people who like Che Guevara, but there's no faction, right? Of, right. I think of, I think the distinctions aren't very were not very clear at the time. It was just like there's there's a good and a bad Marxism. And the bad one is the Soviet, and the good one is Maoist and Cuba and, and Vietnamese, and by extension, certain parts of the USSR as well. I was about to say it, it's also like, but the the weird thing is all these people, including including at least half of the Trotskyists, are Soviet defenses. Right. So like, there's this weird, and, and it's actually the Maoists who are arguably the most Marxist, the most anti-revisionist depending on which group you're talking about. Yeah. Who end up being the least Soviet defensist. Like, yeah, to a de catastrophically destructive level in some yeah. instances. Well, right. Cause, mean, at, Cause at that point, we're not talking about like philosophy. We're not really talking about like what motivates a person or what yeah. should be. We're just talking about like what is necessary to say right now. Yeah. But that's the thing with these, this warm and cold thought. Uh, warm and cold streams from Ernst Bloch that, that really have you thinking. You know, Ernst Bloch is associated with Western Marxism. I find that interesting mm -hmm. because he's also one of the few people associated with, you know, the other the other couple that are associated with, quote, Western Marxism that people never mentioned went back to the DDR. Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, the, the Frankfurt School didn't want to have anything to do with Ernst Bloch because they thought he was too Stalinist. Right. The same, similar to why they kicked out... Uh, Henrik Grossmann and because mm -hmm. um, Grossmann decides after 1936 that while that Stalin is a mixed figure, yeah, um, and which I think is interesting because also that's right before the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact, which I right before, was, <laughs> which I've always like wondered like what did he think about that, um, but. Uh, the, why I think Ernst Bloch's associated with with uh, with quote Western Marxism is the beginning and end of his life. So in the beginning, he's definitely in this more humanistic Karl Korsch stream of interpretation. Mm -hmm. um, in the end, he leaves the DDR over the Prague Spring. Um, right. Um, so it's you know so he does die in Western Germany, but. This is a it's a Prague Spring or a Hungarian uprising. It's one of the two, um, but he's a supporter of the DDR in between. Then, so like again, people are like, oh, he's a Western Marxist. Well, he lived under a formerly Marxist-Leninist regime voluntarily. So, yeah, uh, he he believed in the project and he went to go participate in it. And it was right. it was the uh, the Hungarian Revolution, not the Prague Spring. Yeah, so the, the Hungarian Revolution. The, the Hungarian Revolution is an interesting one because revolution, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because the Hungarian the Hungarian Revolution is also one of mixed characteristics. Like, right. there are clearly fascists involved, but there are also tons of Marxists involved. Yeah, and so, it was heavily, heavily infiltrated and funded by the CIA mm -hmm. at the time as well. Um, right. So it's like, it's one of those situations where uh, having a hard and fast read on, the, on it is going to end up making you wrong. But I do think the su the suppression that comes after it is one of the things that leads a lot of people to who are who are pretty you know ardent 
communist and at least in the German section uh, to leave. Yeah. Um, right. I mean, the, the repression was a disaster. Um, it also like, you know, it's, it, 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 uh, it's one of the reasons why people lost a lot of faith in Lukash in the West too, is his participation right. in the aftermath of that. Um, yep. Uh, but you know, it, a lot of people who are, who are Marxist Leninist supporters leave over the Prague. I mean, not that, well, they, a lot of them leave over Prague Spring too, actually. Well, yeah, but, a lot of them leave over the Hungarian revolution and then the rest of them leave over the Prague Spring. Right. I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, it's it's one of those things like when you study the history of the CPUSA, there's a couple of big exoduses in the high point period. The first one is the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact, yeah. which causes a shit ton of people to leave. And then a lot of them come back in yeah. uh, when the Popular Front is initiated and then they start leaving again. Um, and uh, I think it is the Hungarian uprising, which causes uh, a huge exodus. And then, right. the, you know, the Red Scare, too, so between the two. Um, well, I mean, it's it's the the between the Khrushchev's secret speech or whatever that's, you know, the, the term that oh, yeah. we use is secret speech and the Hungarian it was not secret. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but yeah, it's definitely that period. That's when probably the single biggest exodus happens between it's all 56, though. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so you have this. Well, you, you start seeing a downturn, like the height of uh, the height of. Uh, I think it's forty eight is the height of the CPU uh, USA. Um, but it might be earlier than that. But it's it, it, it's you know that's when it's like at like eighty thousand people or something like that as full members. So you know, there's lots of fellow travelers and stuff too. So probably yeah. double yeah, that. There's like eighty thousand full members in forty eight, but there's like. A million and a half former members who are still part of like front groups or right. aff affiliated in some way. Like the Communist Party in the in the late forties and early fifties was extremely powerful. I know they didn't use it, but they they could have, and who knows what they would have done. Um, and they decline precipitously in the 50s. oh yeah by, by like tens of thousands, uh, uh like a month, right? Yeah. And then, and then they they do not have any advantages from the new, from the return of the new left. Like they don't see, they're one of the few communist groups that don't see a tick up of membership during that right. time period. Right. Um, partly from, from a series of, of internal splits. I know I got pushed back for saying that like the, uh, the RCP was a split from the communist party because there's two organizations between them, but, David's a split from the Communist Party. Yeah. Uh, Bob Avakian enters late, guys. Um, but most people who are in the RCP start their story with Chairman Bob, so they don't really consider a lot of the stuff before that that serious. Um, so I think that's an, that's an interesting problem. Now let's look at the warm stream and cold stream and try to figure out this out. Like, so what do we see here? Like, what do we see at if we look at like where the the ideology of the U.S. Communist Party, I mean the Communist Party of the of the United States, is during this time period, it's all over the place. Like, yeah, it's, it's all over the place. But I think it's colder than it is. At least it's consciously colder. It might not necessarily always be colder, but I don't think there's like any deliberate attempt to uh, right the ship in any particular way. So what if it goes back and forth? It's a uh, it's it's incoherent. In terms of its self conception and in terms of the uh, the outside assessment as well, and I think it's interesting because I think in the nineteen twenties and thirties, I think we'd actually call it warm, it, because during during both yeah. uh, during both the initial lead up and uh, during third periodism and during the early phases of the United Front from below and the Popular Front, it's very voluntaristic. It's very by your bootstraps. It's very like it's led by people like William Z. Foster who are like Marxist Leninist syndicalist. Oh yeah. Like, like I mean, it, I think it, I think it matters like uh that they 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 revive the American revolutionary tradition and all of their like uh points of reference are like the Civil War, Lincoln, Re Reconstruction. That's all like in, it's intending to sort of appeal to uh kind of romantic sort of feelings that are latent in at least a big part of the population. There, there is a there is a way in which you know 
this is part of this tradition. Now, we could talk about a very cold stream form of Marxism, Vietnamese Marxism. Mm-hmm. But Vietnamese Marxism also does this. They still, they're one of the few Marxist Leninist parties on the planet that still actually explicitly talks about the importance of American thought. And they fought them. Right. So, yeah. like, <laughs> well, I mean, like, Ho Chi Minh includes the part of the Declaration of Independence and in his uh, Declaration of Independence from the French Empire. Yeah. And uh, always did respect and admire the American Revolution. Right, as an anti-colonial struggle. <laughs> One of the things I think is interesting about this. Okay, so where do we in this two streams? Where do we put something like Cuba? Because Cuba's, on one hand, it's explicitly a Marxist-Leninist state. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, the the actual ideology coming out of both Castro and of like Guevara is not really of the same kind of deter like hyper economic developmentalism and determinism coming out of the soviet union at the same time right um yeah i mean cuba's never really a developmentalist regime like at any point no it's not it never it never tries to be which is which is also interesting that makes it kind of the odd man out of the national like of the small state national revolution marxist leninist aligned <laughs> groups yeah um, i mean it's like singular it's like alone even yeah it's the odd man out for sure like you know, the other because the other non-developmentalist Marxist-Leninist regime is probably the DPRK, which is about as far away from what was going on in Cuba as you can get as far as intellectual <laughs> justifications, where right. it's actually aligned, what it actually does. Um, yeah, I but mean, again, like the, the thing that pops into my head immediately on mentioning Guevara as a, a warm stream figure is his quote about the revolutionary being driven by feelings of love, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and it's just all of the. The romanticism, the sort of uh, voluntarist emphasis put on resisting American imperialism. Well, and also it like even afterward, like it's the duty of everybody to like find some time to just go become just to go work in the sugarcane fields for a little bit, just because you have to dedicate a part of you and who you are just to the general cause of building up socialism right Right. stuff like that it's like not to be found in a kind of a economic determinist kind of schema and telos of history so you have someone who's like basically like be the cultural revolution but in yourself before the cultural revolution even happens and in 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 china so i mean this is in it and it's interesting because also i mean russia has its cultural revolution too and it's eclipsed um because I think part of what happens, it happens right after the, the, the first Red Terror. And, you know, the first Red Terror is something that Marxists don't like to talk about because you can't blame it on Stalin. And Lenin, uh, Lenin at first really encourages it, but he also is the person like saying like, hey, like you can't kill people just because they were want, just because they're the children of bourgeoisie. Like, <laughs> Like he I mean, yes, does say Lenin, that. Lenin's role is very similar to that of Robespierre. It's just like taking control of something that's happening organically. You know, mm-hmm. it's like, well, the population wants the terror. So like if we don't manage the terror, it's going to get out of control. But it also is Bolshevik figures who are pushing the the sort of like most uh, exterminationist elements of the terror too. Like if you like, yeah. like the, the Red Terror paper is published by the bolsheviks and it's actually criticized by lenin but once he sees people actually doing what it says like well i mean like lenin the big misconception about lenin is that he wasn't a completely hegemonic figure no he was often outvoted yeah Yeah, even like threatened to resign a couple of times he was like if if i have to i will just quit and i'll just join the rank and file and i'll agitate against the whole leadership you know, just because of how much the leadership was not uh, bending to, to his will. Right. Right. I mean, t- to be fair, also, you know, Marxist Leninist of the Stalinist variety will bring this out too. that Stalin did that a couple of times as well. I mean, although he tended to get you back. Well, um, right. right. <laughs> that, like, that difference matters a lot, actually. Yeah. Um, Lenin did not tend to get you back. I mean, you know, and when you read Lenin's like last Testament, which I know some people think is not real. Um, I think, it, I think most historians actually do think it's authentic. Yeah. Um, I, I like, I 
uh, peripherally study Soviet history uh-huh. as well, just because I have a good Soviet historian to learn from in my program. And yeah, they it there are no historians that don't that don't that they don't think it's real. Yeah. By I the way, say no, but like none that I've come across. Grover Fur is not a historian. He's a he's a <laughs> professor of literature. literature. Professor. And I don't. Um, I, yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, but he doesn't read Russian. I don't know. I don't think so, though. Yeah. I read that somewhere. It, it might not be true, though. So I might like this is um, like for public consumption. So, you know, allegedly, I, that's what I've heard. It, it, I find it interesting that most of the people who like take the most vulgar Stalin defenses are almost never historians, n- not even Russian ones. Like it's right. it's uh, it's like, OK, so you found a literature professor and a philosophy professor. OK. Um, right. But those things don't delegitimize a person like outright. But if uh, all the historians are on one side and none of the historians on the other side, that <laughs> that at least says a little bit about what where the legitimacy can be found. Well, I mean, being a historian isn't just reading books that other people wrote and then right. compiling pieces of it together. There's actually a, a method and it's actually rigorous, you know? Yeah. yeah. Right. I am not a historian. I am a I am a I am a history popularizer because yeah. I actually don't use that method. Yeah. Um, Which is fine. But we need but, history popularizers, popularizers. But you know what's funny about that is even I am more rigorous than some of the stuff I've seen. Where I'm like, I'm at least checking my fucking references. You guys didn't even yeah. look. Yeah. Um, yeah, that matters too. So it really does. And yeah. like the the references too. Like I and even uh, historians will do this too. Though, like I, I read recently a uh, a book that quoted um, Susan Buckmore about Hegel, saying that. Uh, Hegel didn't pay any attention to the Haitian Revolution, but if you go look at Susan Buck Morris, what she said about that was that Hegel did pay attention to the Cuban Revolution. The Haitian Revolution. No, sorry, the Haitian Revolution. I think Cuban. Yeah, Haitian yeah. Revolution. Um, but it's interesting because like she took the quote, the, this author took the quote out of context based on a general overview of the book that she wrote about the Haitian Revolution that the West Western philosophy, Western radicals didn't pay enough attention to the Haitian revolution. So right. he, he quoted the gist of the book against Hegel when in reality, Hegel actually did say something about the Haitian revolution. I mean, I mean in Costco reality, Hegel time. actually took a lot of inspiration from and actually tailored a lot of his philosophy to the world that the Haitian revolution represented. Right. Right. The master slave dialectic comes from the Haitian well, revolution, yeah. his observation of the Haitian revolution. Right. Although yeah, it, was, it, it actually turns out to be critical to his thought. Yeah. But he backs away from it. That's Buck he does. Morris's. And I think I think actually that's accurate. Um, yeah, Buck, Buck Morris actually makes that point, too. Like in uh, he, t- he talks about Africans as being non-historic peoples. Yeah. Yeah. The, oh, man, that that is one thing we got from from Hegel that I wish we had not gotten was this. Yeah, we should have historic <laughs> historic and not historic peoples, because if you ever want to find Marx and Engels sounding like idiots in history, it's usually there. Yeah. Well, yeah, especially, Engels, especially Engels and especially in the 1850s. Yeah. When he refers to the Czechs as not historic peoples, Engels yeah. can eat a dick. All right. <laughs> yeah. The other thing well, is, like, although although depending on how you would interpret that, it's it's kind of true. It just depends on what you do with it, you know. Afterwards, like I'm just to being a re-jerk, uh, uh, a knee-jerk reactionary. Uh, my, my other one is chauvinist Marx, who's who takes the right side in the Civil War and takes the white side on abolition, but still says stuff like the Irish have it worse than black slaves. So, yeah. like, like um, that's a very unfortunate uh, turn of phrase. Yeah, uh, Marx um, has some unfortunate initial uh assessments of colonialism as well that he eventually recants and makes up oh yeah yeah like (laughs) at at one point um i think it's in the it's in the new york tribune he like writes an essay praising british colonization of india saying it's going to build up the textile industry and then later like by capital he's like oh actually no it's the exact opposite he does he he does several articles uh reporting when he's living in uh in london on the situation in India, where he recants every nice thing they ever said about British imperialism because he didn't he didn't understand the full extent of what was going on. Yeah, I I wonder what we would yeah. have gotten from him on on the Taiping Rebellion because he writes about it, but he writes about it very generally and he kind of both sides it. Like yeah. Um, the, the, the uh, yeah, I guess that's the sort of proto communist movement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And it's he also doesn't, insane. It's very also wild. Like, <laughs> m- millions of people died. Yeah. And also, like, it kind of sucks. But also, if it didn't happen, everything after would have been worse. Kind of like the English Civil War. Like, the Puritans and the, the you know, the Roundheads would... I'm very glad that I was not alive to witness and interact with them. But looking backwards, I'm also very, very glad that they existed. I was to say, I would have been a Jacobite if I was... Fine. <laughs> and I, like, just well, yeah. Know it. Like, I, I mean, I would have been on the side of the Catholicism. And it wishes to say on the, on the happier side of life. The high church he, Anglicans? Yeah. yeah. Which yeah. is to say that uh, just based on what I know of myself right now, if I could just transplant myself back to like 15... 49 i would have been on the wrong side yeah so luckily uh, that's just not a thing that we have to do i mean well this this is where we, we think about we have to think about these things though from from a very interesting standpoint so for example uh in the context of scottish national liberation being a jacobite is actually progressive from the context yeah. of the movement of the bourgeois revolution it's not and right. lenin to give lenin credit was pretty clear that like on many of these things in history, like they're of a dual nature and you can't really clearly define them. Uh, you know, I, I, we were talking about this earlier, but I was thinking about this in his writings about Serbia, where he's like, look, if, 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 if it wasn't in the context of world war, yes, Serbian national liberation would be something every socialist should support. However, in the context of a world war, you can't support any of these sides. Right. So wow, it's almost as if like th- there's like a tension. Uh, between two different opposing forces, and they like uh, they like drive history forward in some way. <laughs> Dude, okay, so people say that dialectics doesn't mean anything. It's because they don't fucking understand it. Yeah. Um, they also say that dialectics is systems theory, and as a person integrated in the systems theory, no, it's not. But yeah. it is related. Um, sure. Uh, w- w- it's also not folk Taoism. Um, no. which is no. the other thing people tend to do with it, which is just like, well, there's always the core in the other thing. And, and then it emerges from contradiction. No, I think but, the only way to, to begin to appreciate dialectics is to like actually study dialectics and not find some other thing that's kind of like that's simpler to understand because it's not like those things. No, <laughs> complexity theory and system theory is more complicated to understand. But um, let's, let's, I mean, let's talk about this because I think the Warren stream and the Cole stream actually comes out of a dialectical approach to this. Because what, yeah. what you're actually saying with this is like, these are both tendencies in Marxist thought. They're both real. Mm-hmm. And you should not favor, like, you're going to always favor one of them over the, over the other. And yet, also, you should realize that by doing that, you're failing. Right. Like, like... And I don't know how to explain that exactly because it seems like I'm asking you to hold two contradictory things at the same time. But actually, well, luckily, only in that's going to happen anyways, right? But only in moments of success, when you actually sublate and you get, unfortunately, the metaphor turns into lukewarm water. But <laughs> <laughs> which God will spew out of His mouth <laughs> if you know your Old Testament? <laughs> but, for, but fortunately for us. Um, the owl of Minerva will only spread its wings with the falling of dusk. So it's only yeah. in retrospect that we'll actually know whether we, we are favoring one or the other. Right. Uh, and, uh, it's what like I, Zin Cohen almost, right? You have to hold both in your mind. Yeah, I like yeah. to talk about this with fictitious capital, <laughs> believe it or yeah. not, because I, I am economically minded. But I'm like, you only know if capital is fictitious when you try to valorize it and you can't. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and what does that mean? When you can't actually spend it, when you go to when your appraisal actually falls apart, that's what it very practically means. So you have this appraisal, you're worth this much, then all of a sudden you try to spend it and you get or try to sell the assets, and then you and you realize no, you're only worth this much. That other stuff that was fictitious, but you can't know it until you've done it. Yeah. Um, so every uh, every attempt to just like be dialectical and to like enforce a dialectical way of things unfolding is, is always, um, it's always going to end in failure. Well, and, and we should talk about the history of, like, I've, I've talked about this before, but let's like, let's talk about, and we'll get, bring this back into this metaphor. Cause I think this will get us into like our, 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 our kind of dialectical pessimism. All right. Um, which is, but dialectics itself, one isn't even just Western. It emerges concurrently in several different cultural traditions. You see it develop in the Dharmic tradition, in Chinese, in Chinese uh, Taoist and Confucian thought, 
and in um, both Christian and pre-Christian metaphysics. And the reason why it develops is because it's how you fucking figure out definitions. If you can't agree on axioms, how do you do it? You do it through dialogue and debate. Right. Uh, both both dialogic is when you kind of agree and can build from agreement. Dialectic is when you have to argue it out, but you're not arguing. It's not just like an analytic argument where you're argument where you're arguing over the logic. You're literally arguing over the terms. How do you get to the terms at hand? Right. Now, dialectic post German idealism says, okay. We need to make this less about just debates between interlocutors and more about the world itself. Mm -hmm. So how do we see these debates playing out in history and where do we see them emerging and creating things that you don't expect? Um, so there's there are contradictory notions. If anyone ever tries to really sit down, like I know that I'm a I'm not a against you know, like bourgeois rights, but if you try to figure out any bourgeois right like consistently and every now and then liberals are kind of half do this and you realize that they're almost on to something, but then they can't try fully take it through. Like, for example, that like freedom of association is inherently contradictory. Um, why? Because some people might want to associate with me and might not want to let them. And that's where discrimination comes from and anti discrimination oh, right, right, right. laws, right? Yeah. Like it's inherently contradictory. Um, freedom of speech is actually inherently contradictory. Yeah, for the same uh, reason. Yeah. Um, and because all of these things have both positive and negative elements to them, and the way that liberals traditionally have gotten out of this contradiction is to just focus on the negative parts of it. Like, um, and that's, you know that's where things start really falling apart. So, so from a dialectical perspective, we should not, we, we should always expect there to be as long as there's divisions in the population, that's as long as there's classes and even other social divisions, really um, for there to be tensions and these rights that cannot easily be overcome by the rights themselves. Well, yeah. Right? And even we have to like, embrace the fact that contradiction is going to be a fact of life for our lifetimes at least and maybe for forever now i like you, to you, talk about this in a very yeah. specific way because people who are trained in analytic philosophy do not know what we're talking about right. because they're like but you don't mean contradiction the way we mean it no we do not mean contradiction in hegelian philosophy is not a syntax contradiction it is not it right. is not an absolute a equals not a like that's not what's going on there Although, right. what is actually going on there is history is fuzzy enough that A does equal not A, depending on how you're defining A in its emergence in the world. Like, right, and also depending even from one moment to the next even sometimes. Right. So, that, that you know, and I get where there's this kind of liberal critique that this leads to like well you can make everything mean anything this way and vulgarly you kind of can like you like like if you're really if you're really just trying to do apologia it's really easy to do with well, dialectics well, and that is a problem well yeah. right but i think there's a that's why you we have to like you know like there, there's a reason why hegel just to take one example he had political positions and he stuck to them and yeah he was navigating contradictions and so on and he like he made judgments about whatever was happening and what might happen. Right. But he's also, he's also very clear from his own philosophy that he can't know if his political positions are right. And by the well, way, exactly from the and, philosophy and, of right, he's wrong. About some a lot of, of stuff. Some, <laughs> yeah. Well, some stuff, but yeah, yeah. He's cer certainly wrong about at least a few things that are like so important that we have to be, the, to, the, I mean, to, to critically, the, the Prussian state's going to be the end of history. <laughs> like, that's pretty big. <laughs> well, even the way that we would determine the end of history, like for our purposes, I would say, yeah, definitely that's that's wrong. But there's another way of looking at it where like the end of history is the, is the period of human development in which individual human beings can all concentrate together at a social level and influence things like a, 
or to put it another way, an era of democracy. And so right. we are still in, living in the end of history, which began in 1789. And so depending on even how you interpret that ex exact phrase, Hegel is either wrong or right. Right. <laughs> I mean, well, and, that was and, very dialectical of you, Jason. And to be fair, I mean, this is where people get kind of people push back on me on this. I've been recently pushed back on this. And let's talk about this. This is where this is where the cold and warm streams actually don't always help you. Because I can't use dialectics to predict things. I can only use dialectics to understand things in the past and what is likely to emerge. And attempts right. to use dialectics to predict things. And Marx did, by the way, uh, usually amounts to eating a shit lot of crow. Right. Right. Um, that's the thing that I think we, that there are two there in the broadest sense, I think there's two things to Marxism. One is it's a way of understanding history and of, of understanding the likely movement of history. And two, it's a way to predict the future and the coming of socialism and its realization and being, we're really good at the first part. We've been accurate on the first part for the most part. Yeah. We are shitty, world historically shitty, at the second part, and and the the problem that you have is that liberalism, conservatism, etc., don't have the second part. They don't right. really have the first part either. They they're basically like, gen, like liberalism began as a historic project with clear delimitations, but but at this point, it's an orientation. No, right. It's like it's it, it is a set of related emotions and temperaments. Um, that's not how it starts. That is what it is now. Um, yeah, but it's, it's, they, uh, they benefit a lot from having no pretense of having that second part. Correct. So you can't hold them accountable yeah. for failure. Whereas like Marxists have a problem because on one hand of the revolutionary traditions after the liberal one, we're the ones that succeeded. On the other hand, we're also the only ones that failed. <laughs> so <laughs> because we actually had a chance to do something. Right. So, and it's very interesting reading, uh, bring back Goldner's book and the readings that I was talking about in the beginning, these kind of three books that are in my mind. Goldner is writing from the perspective of the late seventies. And he talks about the crisis of Marxism. But at that point, that crisis seems paradoxical uh, because on one hand, you have Marxist-inspired national revolutions all over the globe that are finishing up at the time period that he's writing this book. But on the other hand, the Marxist world very much seems in malaise, as does the capitalist world. I mean, the 70s right. is kind of like a, a point of general malaise, but there's all these national revolutions going on that start in the 50s that really continue up into the 1980s that seem right. like, oh, you know, and Marxism is seen as part of that. But... From just 12 years after that book is published, that crisis no longer seems like a million years. It seems like a collapse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because Cuba's backed into a corner. The DPRK is backed into a corner. Vietnam and China have to open up to the West. Um, Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore. Most of the Warsaw Pact doesn't exist anymore. Um, even in the social democratic countries, of like the Scandinavian countries, the social Democrats are actually on the, are, are politically losing. Um, it seems like a completely different world. And yet that malaise, that, that intellectual deadness is interesting because it was an indicator of a coming real historical shift. Right. It came, that malaise came 20 to 30 years before. Like, and that's interesting, right? So how do we deal with that? From the cold and warm stream, this is an interesting sort of problem because we talked about when you realize the cold and warm stream is, is in these big eventual changes or like when something actually happens. Um, now, I'm sorry, the, 19, the, the 1970s to the 1990s is a cold shower for socialism. Mm -hmm. And yeah. a whole lot of current politics is... In my mind, is basically just trying to deny that that happened. It is like a trauma response where, yeah, where yeah. it's like suppression. I mean, yeah, like all politics. Well, at least not all politics. But any politics which has a claim to being interesting. <laughs> well, including it, the very, very, very bad ones. 
Well, I mean, you know, I guess that that is true that right now, the, like non-centrist politics is both emergent and interesting and all over the place, and yet also somehow can't seem to win even when it wins. And I don't just mean in the left wing sense. Also, I mean like all kinds of new forms of rightism that have emerged in the last. Uh, two decades that are reminiscent of early 20th century forms of rightism. And yet they also, when they win, they just normalize. Like it's not yeah. like, like, it's like if Mussolini had, you know, joined with Britain and decided to oversee a post-war Keynesian transition without the war in the first place. Yeah. Which is to say if Mussolini had gotten what he wanted. Yes, actually. Because he did not want to side with Hitler, but but um, it, it are like, yeah, are, because you have like, what is it? For Lange's Spain, for example, as fascist as it is, uh, it set out World War II. <laughs> just right. set yeah. it out. Like we're just not involved. And like, as soon as as soon as the uh, you know the Axis started losing World War II, they started defascistizing. Yeah, they 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 normalized to the point of their own whimper collapse like right. like they you know it's like well i don't know but maybe maybe the king will restore democracy which is what happens yeah. um, as soon as franco uh, was gone democracy was restored it's just like well we had this blip and i guess you guys got rid of the communists so we can let my democracy happen again which actually interestingly also happens in latin america all the time yeah like you have these Cadillos, they're hugely traumatic and they're very, very violent, but they all just kind of end. Like they yeah. don't even get revolutionarily overthrown in most cases. They just sort of like, uh, we've exhausted society. We can't kill everybody. Let's just stop. Right. But like, that's all only because of the war, because if not for the war, then all that development would happen in a different way. And maybe they were, there would have been revolutions that had to overthrow them. So it's just, you know, Again, it's like in retrospect, we can see how something played out, but uh, nothing is guaranteed. Not not at any point in history is is the outcome ever like the one that is possible. All right, and I, I think what's interesting about Block is Block's posting based on this tendency on Marxist, and and also that comes up in critiques of Marx. And I think one of the things about it is when people make it, I can't deny it because it is in there, yeah. where Marx sounds like socialism is inevitable yeah and yeah. it's absolutely inevitable and then also you have points like you know socialism or barbarism which, which is not a direct quote from marx but actually comes out of marx marxism own phrasing right which indicates a common ruin of the contending classes right yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah which which indicates he does not actually think it's inevitable and right. i was just reading how draper bend over backwards to try to not make that a contradictory statement. Yeah. Like, well, and, and the problem there lies in the fact that Marx is both trying to do political economy and also political agitation. And right. they require an entirely different emphasis on things which are only merged um, in retrospect. But at on the surface, they just, it's like, you know, you turn off one faucet and turn the other one on. It, it, however, the problem that you have is outside of capital Marxist writings actually aren't that clearly delineated. Like, Right. Like right. there's a yeah. like is the Brumaire a a polemical text or is it an, an analytical text? In my mind, it's got to be both. Yeah. I think like, I think it's in, in certain works like the Brumaire, I think he is trying to do both. Um but yes, like the manifesto versus capital. I mean, I think yeah. Gramsci is one of the first people who sees that there's a tension there. Yeah. Um yeah, unlike Kowski, who's just like, oh, the manifesto was okay, I guess. But the real, the real question is the economic doctrines of Karl Marx, which is a as a phrase that uh, no one should ever have been able to say. The doctrines of Marx, even though he has like at least two positions on everything. <laughs> but, but this this is actually interesting because the people who try to turn in turn it into method methodology, Lukash, for example, end up making the methodology substanceless, like. Like mm -hmm. Lukash's answer to what a proletarian revolution is is tautological. It's not even like what the proletarians do. It, it is what the proletarians do when manifested by a politically conscious proletarian movement in itself and for itself simultaneously, which you can only know once it happens, but somehow that's scientific. Which, I mean, it might be true, but it's useless. Right. Like, 
w and I say that because like if that's your methodology, then it's not a methodology. There's no method to that. Um, well, the me the method is just to have been correct. <laughs> um, but like when you argue that Marxism is a science, and Lukash does. And, you know, we were talking about this warm and cold stream trying to combine in the same person. And that's what's trying to happen there. Right. Like, right, yeah. right. but it ends up being meaningless. Like, it's just tautological, like in, in the bad sense, not in the like definitional sense, which, of course, like, yes, a chair is a chair because it's a fucking chair. Shut up. Well, well right. I mean, a, a, one thing that would help us out a lot is if uh, we all had the same meaning of science in mind all since before Marx and certainly now. But yes. even, even in Marx's own time, both conceptions of science, I mean, at least more than one conception of science is used. And that, right. that um, the lack of recognition of that contradiction leads to, like what you just said with Lukash, it's just, at, at a certain point, it just becomes unintelligible nonsense. Well, well, the new left response to this was to focus in on the fact that Weisenschaft doesn't quite mean science. It doesn't mean natural science. But even that's kind of a cop out because it does also sometimes mean that. Right. Like um, pre presaging. It would be like me criticizing someone for saying, well, when we say science, we don't mean biology. But sometimes we do. Like... <laughs> um, and, and well, you're right. One of the things is one of the things that haunts Marx's claims to science is that there has still been, really, despite the practical success of science, ask any motherfucker to tell you what it actually is in a way that is, that is both coherent to practice and to non-contradictory definitions, and they can't. Well, right, yeah. There's no answer to the demarcation problem to this day. Yeah. Like. Which I mean, which you know, makes vulgar skeptics online really uncomfortable because they're like, "But what about pseudoscience?" And I'm like, "Well, we only know pseudoscience in the retrospect, frankly." I mean, like, that's there's a re I think you know, again, I, partly it's just not very well known anymore. But uh, when it, it, I think as early as like 1807, Hegel was talking about uh, the need to elevate philosophy to the level of science to make philosophy scientific. Which is to say that like science is a thing, and philosophy is a thing, and to the extent that we can merge them, we're onto something. And it's not clear whether or not we even have an idea of what that would look like now. I think that is Complicated and hard, yeah. It's, it's it's complicated and hard because it ties stuff in. The other problem is like Hegel wants to raise philosophy up to the level of, uh, wants to raise philosophy up to the level of science and science up to the level of philosophy. That's why it's the science of logic, right? Right. But then Marx actually even up the gambit from there because he's like, well, the point isn't just to understand the world, get get the science and philosophy together and rigorous enough. It is also to be able to use it in ways that change the course of human history, which is an even bigger demand. Mm -hmm. um, but Marx says that, and yet he also says simultaneously and concurrently um, that, you know, this is inevitable. And one of the things I want to push back on is, yes, I think there's a difference between the polemic and the analytic claim. The problem is, is that he doesn't ever actually explicitly contradict himself in the, in the analytic. It, he argues against himself, but he doesn't say, okay, socialism, socialism's not inevitable. Right. right. I, don't, I don't think that, uh, I don't think that Marx really was, I don't exactly know how I want to put this. I don't think that Marx ever really thought about what we would have done a hundred years from his lifetime. Cause I just, I think he just thought like, this is going to work itself out at some point. Somebody is going to come along and do this better. It, at least everybody's going to know what I mean whenever I say what I say. And of course, none of that's true. So he's just like, he just doesn't account for it. And, and it's our like accounting for it is a, well, that's an ongoing project and we've failed at it most of the time. 
Sort of like Paul's letters. He didn't think anyone was going to turn them into like books of the Bible, but here we are trying to figure yeah. out what the fuck Paul was talking about. <laughs> well, yeah, creating exactly. an entire uh, like theology out of it. Yeah, yeah. Of course, that doesn't help us. You know, we no. still have to do that. But uh, yeah, it's just that Marx's work or Paul's work, for that matter, is barely going to help us in making sense of how to make sense of Marx Marx's work. It's a, it's what's called a conundrum. And I think that's that's something that to to talk about these streams again because this this seems to have somewhat lost the yeah to kind of tie yeah. this back in because the, the conundrum of that. these streams, the conundrum of the stream. Well, I do it too, but the conundrums of the streams actually comes from this tension, right? Right. Right. Like. And it's a tension I actually would point out isn't entirely in just in Marxism, because most liberals today also are stuck in this cul-de-sac. Um, and it, and 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 in their in their worldview, um, it's even more it's even more blatantly self-contradictory. So like we always talk about systemic oppression, but we focus on individual responses to it almost solely. Right. Uh, even, even so much as the fact that we talk about systemic uh, racism, but then we want to collapse it into bias. Then you have someone like Abraham X. Kendi, who, while I think gets a lot of bad rap from people uh, for what he's accused of saying, I will point out that his, his want to like collapse racism back into one coherent category by pretending that implicit bias a uh, bigotry and um, structural racism are all the same thing because they're all related is a move that is it's only clarifying if you think that having something easy to talk about makes it clearer. Hmm. Um, and, and so in this too, you see this tendency towards like volunteerism. Well, you have to check your privilege, but you didn't give yourself right. your privilege. Like privilege is not something you gave yourself. Now, yeah, I think these discourses are, are highly distorting and highly removed from class. But the thing is, the tensions that we see in Marxism are in those tensions, too. Like, it's already there. The conservative doesn't have those tensions because they have no pretense to consistency. They don't. Yeah, that's true. like. 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 They sometimes have pretense to principles, but their principles, even when they have them, are modular. Like, and let's be honest, most of the time they don't even have that. Like, it's it's a it's like that's why. That's why it's not it's, it, it it is not a is not a the reason why it is not a a bug but a feature that 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 uh conservative values can pivot on a dime. It's not just hypocrisy and it's not just cultishness, although that is part of it. It is also because they're defending the status quo and the status quo is always changing. Right. Like, whereas we're trying to both promote a positive program, all right, which is changing the world mm -hmm. and battle against the status quo and also not be weird ass gurus who make predictions that aren't true. Yeah. Right. Which is a very hard, that's not just a two thing to keep together. That's three things to keep together. Our conditions of victory, it's like playing a game where your condition is you have to completely change the game board, and the other guy's condition is you just have to survive. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. that, one of those is way easier than the other. Like, um, which is why I think uh, conservatism is also often easier to have a positive vision even compared to liberalism even though liberalism has this inclusivity and justice uh at the current time period the 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 inclusivity and justice is actually not inclusive at all no right and and that is i mean again as marxist that shouldn't surprise us that is like a particular historical development that like shit libs are, are shit libs and sometimes I guess I push back on you guys on this because I'm like, well, but shit lives are shit lives because they're also in the same world we are mm -hmm. like, like we, in some ways we have to hold them accountable for being that way. 
but in other in other ways like we also have to admit that like we're not that different from them and they're in this weird cul-de-sac too and they're also failing at whatever their conditions are it's just that they their their way of achieving victory is to deny they ever had the conditions that they said they had in the first place <laughs> when view when viewing the most disgusting shit liberty available one must always think there but for the grace of god go i and guard right. against this <laughs> right very well said <laughs> But yeah, I mean the the like you said, the cul-de-sac that the liberals are in that makes that makes uh, the just insane and revolting behavior of the liberals uh, as bad as it is is the same one that we're stuck in. And um, the worst part about it is is that the left is being drawn towards the liberals as a pole of attraction. Like there's no independent Marxist pull of attraction anymore. There's no like uh, labor movement to rally around to to speak of. I mean, there's there's some stuff going on. Obviously, I don't I don't want to downplay that. There is some stuff going on, but but as far as like a strong leftist anti-capitalist uh, worker worker centered pull of attraction, there isn't one. That doesn't exist. So what we have instead is. Uh, the left being drawn to liberal causes, causes that are, I mean, inclusivity is good, right? LGBT rights are good. Uh, trans allowing trans people to exist is good, but it's not working class politics. Right. And without that, that's, that's the, um, the anchor. I also want to put out that it's also not, not this is, I know this sounds like a, this is this is a this is a thing that I, I need to clarify because a lot of people think you can't walk into bubble gum at the same time. Right, right. I mean, but no, it's but, just that first well you taken, have to. I agree. It's just that if you don't um chew, put the bubble gum in your mouth first, you'll walk away from it, and then you cannot walk. Right, no, and no, chew gum. I agree. <laughs> I'm not saying that like, <laughs> and what I mean by that is just that like, it's it it certainly should be and can be working class organizing, but if you're not first organized in the class as a class then then it's just not yeah. so here this is actually one of the this is a crucial tension that i think we should point out that and, and this whole roll arm cold string discussion because race and gender are ones where this actually becomes pretty clear yeah on one hand we think as we are marxist that yeah. the predominant division amongst human beings is in the way they organize their labor force mm -hmm. now this gets muddled with women because we also think that the first division of labor is gendered under agriculture. Mm -hmm. And frankly, while Ingalls works under a lot of bad anthropological assumptions, that seems to be one that is mostly true. Right. Um, there, it, there, it, there are gendered hunter gatherer societies. We, um, we don't know how, like we can't really project them all the way back into antiquity. Um, but there also seems to be less gender hierarchy and less division of labor and hunter gatherer societies. And right, yeah. what is also interesting, sometimes there is less division of labor in agrarian societies than there is, um, although there is some, but that like, like the idea of the, like the nuclear family division of labor, the bourgeois division of labor, um, where the where the woman is a manager of the household that is not unique to bourgeois society like that's part of like greek aristocratic society in athenian democracy for example but in general it is not a historic norm because if you're running a farm and even if one person's running the household everyone's got to fucking work labor's well, part of that well right like if we think of history as just a line that just goes forward and up then you're going to miss out on all kinds of stuff because that is a way of doing things at one point, and then it becomes later. It becomes again the way of doing things on a, you know, higher level or whatever. But, but it's, not, it's not like it's just it wasn't, and then capitalists came along, and now it is. It's just it is again and more, and so that is both liberating and also increasing exploitation at the same time. So one of one of my I come out of the platypus society. People know this, but I'm not one of them. And one of my critiques of them is like they have the revolution and the bourgeois revolution begins it and communism will be the fulfillment of that right and 
and I tend to completely push back on that because I think that's not a great reading of Marx for one thing, but I also think it's just not historically true because they have to constantly talk about regression, but it's like just the failure to voluntaristically live up to the liberal revolution for them. Right. Whereas for me, it's like, no, these ideals were always contradictory. Yeah. Like, and that's what dialectics means. And they're contradictory because they're also materially contradictory. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's not just about fucking freedom. Like, like one of the things, one of the things that you have to to deal with as a Marxist is to say, well, most people's conception of freedom is actually only freedom for a certain amount of people. Mm -hmm. um, and that's absolutely true. But the reason why I bring this up, though, is because I think we are the result of these contradictions in liberalism. Like that's why we exist. Yeah. Like we are not liberals, but we are not cleanly anti-liberals either and i think that needs to be understood because these warm stream cold stream problems you want to see where it shows up in a vulgar form not just in marxism it shows up in a much more vulgar form in your average resist liberal because on one hand they're constantly talking about history as linear progress of which they are on the right side of right whatever the fuck that means which no one really knows on, but but you see this tendency there, like we're on the right side of history. History is always more inclusive. History is always better. well. It's like it's like it's bending towards justice, and even if it's long, it's eventually going to get to the right place. And so, the being on the right side is just always to be on our side. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, these same liberals tend to be catastrophists in a heartbeat. Right. Yeah. 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 It's it's always we are always teetering on the verge of fascism. Right. Every election is the most important election ever. Uh, fascism is always around the corner, and it's been that way since Reagan, at least. Mm -hmm. um, even though the policy... I mean, one of the things that I have not heard liberals really address is that while the tenor of the policies between, between the Biden administration and the Trump administration are different, but a whole lot of the changes Trump made to American foreign policy have been maintained and extended, just given a human face, by yeah. Joe Biden. And his administration, but even and, foreign policy only. There's also domestic policy as well, including immigration. Yeah, I was about to say immigration policy is is actually probably more restrictive now. It's definitely yeah. more successfully restricted because it's not resisted by anybody. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And and there are, you even get some some of my liberal and left liberal friends to admit this, and yet they don't really know how to do anything about it, and they just sort of accept it. Um, you saw this in anti-war activism in prior times. Like the Democrats were anti-war from 2004 to 2008, nine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Eight. Well, whenever, whenever Obama decided he wanted to drone strike people, all of a sudden they weren't uh, uh, anti-war anymore. But yeah, which, 2009, I guess. Which is funny. Just like it took Clinton to fully neoliberalize and weaken the welfare state. It took mm -hmm. Obama to neoliberal the finish and fully neoliberalize the army. Yeah. Uh, one of the things when people talk about the poverty draft and they don't understand that the poverty draft used to be real, it's not anymore. But when people are like, oh, it's never been real, it was real until about 2005. Um, and particularly if you look at it in not just in an individual perspective, but you look at the regions in which the army is recruiting the most from, because they're always the poorer parts of the country. And, right, right. and the reason why is even is like you're from you guys are from Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, outside of the major metropolitan areas, what was keeping a lot of small town Texas alive? Uh, well, our town was military base and oil. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say you have oil, but like, yeah. but if you don't have oil, it's a military base nearby, yeah. is it not? And it's yeah, and it's absolutely. not just it's almost not just always in the military. It's also all the things serving the military. When the military bases contracted under Bush and then really accelerated contracted under Obama into the drone warfare we have today, mm -hmm. whole parts of the red states, the people that that's when the red states died. The people don't really seem to put that together. Yeah. Like all the economic collapse of the red states, they finally neoliberalized the military. Military Keynesianism ended. Yeah. Right. Okay, what does this have to do with 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 red stream uh, with Warren stream red stream blue stream with Warren stream cold stream? Well, there's a cold stream to that, and there's a warm stream to that, but we don't look at either at the same time. We can't hold both of them in our heads. So, what's the warm stream to that? 
the war on street to that was like the voluntaristic efficiency of the Bush administration. Mm -hmm. The cold stream to that was the humanization for us, not for anybody else, of warfare under the Obama administration as a natural resource of technological development. Right. As a natural out, um the natural all, outcome yeah, and resource yeah. of technological development. Like and it also continues to this weird thing in the United States where the military is a beloved institution, although conservatives love it less than they used to, actually. Liberals now like it more than they used to. That's weird. It's really um, weird. It's the same with like the CIA. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, very the liberals much so. love the CIA now, and now the fucking conservatives hate it. Yeah, and it's the FBI. Uh, um, it's fucking what? <laughs> uh, well, it's just it's kind of like the early Cold War again. Yeah, in, it really is. But yeah. you know, as farce. Yeah. Um. So we have to. We look at that. Now, Cold and Warren stream stuff, one of the big things that we have to deal with that I haven't heard you guys talk about since you pulled this from Block, how do we, you know, it's clear when we talk about revolutions, like the voluntaristic revolutions, that's Guevara, that's Castro, that's Mao, um, that's Lenin. I mean, to a real sense, of, I mean, even though Lenin's, Lenin's writings are very cold stream, what he actually does right. is not that at all. <laughs> well, he um, flips the switch, right? Mm-hmm. Like he uh, opposes insurrection, and then when he realizes he can't oppose it anymore, he flips the switch and then champions yeah. insurrection. Right. And, so, and I mean, his definitions of socialism become increasingly colder as mm -hmm. as building socialism gets harder and harder. Right. Right. So state capitalism becomes a necessary phrase, etc. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. phase because be, because they didn't join up. So what's interesting is is. Uh, in many ways, Lenin, without, I don't even think he realized he was doing this because um, very early on he was not exposed to like the Vera Zurich letters and whatnot. But like he ends up doing what Marx says you should do uh, in the Vera Zurich letters, which is try to like piggyback off the, like, their strategy actually is kind of a backdoor way of what Marx implies in the unsent Vera Zurich letters, which is like if you, join up to a post-capitalist society that went through capitalism, you might not have to. And then right. that doesn't happen. And then we get to the very voluntaristic, we're going to we're gonna do this developmentalism internally, which mm -hmm. is really hard to do. And what what is ironic about that is it does make Plakhanov look good because what, for all Plakhanov's shenanigans uh, as leader of the, uh, of the social democrats of Russia and et cetera. And there's a lot of shenanigans, mm -hmm. um, including like suppressing shit and stuff like that. Like, well, uh, including just like outright opposing the 1905 revolution. Yeah. Just, yeah. Just saying, Oh yeah. The workers should not take into arms. Yeah. Which but, is absurd. Like, Lynn's response is perfect for that. Cause he says, nevertheless, they did. <laughs> and, and, and because they did, we, as Marxists, we are obligated to join them. Right. So, although that worker volunt like that worker that aligning yourself when workers do that becomes hard be becomes something harder and harder to do too with, with right. as we go on. Well, yeah, sure. Uh, um, but it's you're right. He becomes you move to this. There's this weird oscillation that in the warm cold where people switch on a dime. Where, like, one of the things with current China defense, it's a lot of dungest, are hyper voluntaristic on revolution and then hyper cold stream on developmentalism. Mm -hmm. But also, they kind of ignore that it would require, like, it requires people to join, like, the, like there's still an implication that, like, for most of the world to do this, you either have to join up to China or the West. Mm -hmm. And you would really be better and a lot less deaf if the West and China were somehow on the same side because they were both socialist. Like, although that last part's not talked about. Like, because... It's, it's, it is implicit, but it's not talked about. It's not talked about because it, it it's like, that would be too warm. But then also, if you don't believe that, then none of their fucking politics makes any sense. Like, why would you even like if, if it really is, it's just you have to have China win. Then why are you even involved in politics? Uh, other than right. like a fifth column in a war that's not happening. <laughs> like, um, um, I I just also wanted to point out, too, and we talked about this previously. I don't remember if it was with you, Varn, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, 
the the Verizoshlis letters where Marx puts out the the idea that uh, you could skip over the bourgeois revolution in Russia possibly also shows up in um, preface to the Communist Manifesto written by Ingalls. Yeah, Ingalls publishes them post facto, but then yeah. uh, but then Pokhanov suppresses that apparently. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but so, I remember we were talking about this, and I think that we. I think we got it wrong. We said it only showed up in those unpublished letters, but then I later on found found it. I mean, I remembered this in the back of my mind somewhere. Like it was in the, the preface to a like the Communist Manifesto that Ingalls wrote in like 1870 something. something. Right. Yeah. 88 actually, I think. 88? Yeah. yeah, it's after it's after Marx is dead. Yeah. There's a whole lot of stuff that we think of crucial that's released by Ingalls. I mean, one of the most weird things is the current battles over critique of the Goethe program where there's yeah. where uh, one, there's the people who think it's absolutely crucial because it abolishes the body form Two, There are Stalinists who like it. Cause it's the only time where you can see Marx talk about like, well, I mean, th there's that in a, and, and a section of the Grundessa where you can talk mm -hmm. about, well, you have to have parts of the prior forms of society and the current forms, but they're different. They're actually completely different in a new form of society because like, like he talks about like usury capital working differently under under capitalist conditions than it does under feudal conditions, although it's exists in both. Um, and the only time you see the feudal version of it is when like capitalists are fucking up. That's mm -hmm. actually in the Grundisa. Um, but so, so there's all this use of, of the critique of the Goethe program. And then there's this current, like from the Lars Lee, slash social republic school who were like you guys are too mean to the Goethe congress hmm. uh because the I'm Goethe congress didn't actually adopt all the language that was critiqued so um you're slandering um uh yeah this is the new line that Lars Lees took in platypus that's being also promoted by like the neokowskiists and the marxist unity group and a cosmonaut Oh, I, um, I was not aware. I needed to look into that. Um, because it's a critique of the draft program of the, of the Goethe program. It's not yeah, the one that's yeah. actually adopted. But then they have to ignore how much importance Lenin puts on it because like whole chapters of state and revolution are based off of the critique of the Goethe program. Like, yeah. And Lenin thought it, I mean, and, and Engels thought it was important too because he publishes it when he publishes his critique of the effort program. And and so it's hard for me to like so people like oh it was not a big thing he only sent it to 20 members and there's a reason why it's suppressed he you know i'm like i don't know i think it's actually still pretty important the the point though is like even the reception history of marx is really difficult because if like you limit yourself to stuff marx actually signed off of and published formally in his life you got uh was it you have the german ideology no, I don't think that was published. No, German ideology was posted. It was uh, posted <laughs> in eighteen eighty one. When published it? Uh, after his death, right? Yeah, I think it's published yeah. by Engels late because it couldn't. Not because they didn't. He did sign off on it though. They wanted to have it published. He just couldn't get it published. Um, but what is it? Capitals, Volume Two, Three, Theories of Surplus Value, um, Critique of Goethe Program. Uh, You're talking the, about stuff that that you would not count. Right. Yeah, but stuff okay, is yeah, all right. published post posthumously. Um, uh, the thesis on Feuerbach is not public. Like that's yeah. posthumous. Like, like, like I mean, uh, easily the vast majority of what constitutes Marxism proper did not yet yeah, didn't exist for a while. It's the journalism that would if you were limiting yourself to stuff Marx signed up on. It's the journalism, Capital Volume One, and the uh, that's the manifesto. The manifesto. Yeah. There's one of the early books that is published early. Um, oh, the poverty of philosophy. The poverty of philosophy. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, Dude, critique of the uh, the German ideology didn't come out until 1932. Wow. Okay. So yeah. it's even later than I thought. Yeah. Like, so it's like it's post Ingalls even. Mm -hmm. But I, I, published by the Soviet Union. One of the things I will say though is that isn't that isn't because Marx didn't want it published. They did try to get it published. No one yeah, would publish yeah. it. I just looked it up, and that's like the first sentence is they could never find a publisher. But like the political and economics manuscripts, all the versions of them, including 1844 and Grundessa, etc. Mm -hmm. th those were all those weren't even published. But like those were basically they are effectively notes. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Um. W so much of the stuff we have to pull from letters. Um. 
because the letters clarify what's said. Uh, and then there's all the economic manuscripts and everything but Capital Volume 1, which are all, like, like really, like, if you only have Capital Volume 1, even though it's got stuff in it that's late, because, you know, the last revision of Capital Volume 1 is actually after um, he's stopped writing Capital Volume 3. But um, you don't have most of Marxism at all. Right. And in fact, it's it's like it, I do start having more sympathy towards the Second International when I'm like, oh, shit, they had so little like. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think the, the number of Marxists they've even a clue about volume three is all posts like after the Second International. Most I mean, whatever. So I mean, very, Engels is putting them together in the yeah. beginnings of the Second International, right? Like, yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, but I so, think that um. Uh, when Kautsky writes the economic doctrines of Karl Marx, I don't think he'd even read volume three yet. Right. I, I think, I think I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. Who puts that? Who, who's like the, like Bernstein's actually a specialist in volume two and three. Cause he works with Ingalls on it. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and Bernstein is a very, uh, you know, to mention Bernstein at all is already problematic. Yes. But well, you, you want to talk about the, uh, a bad synthesis of warm and cold, right? Yeah. Oh well, well, yeah. yeah. Like, it's, well, it's like he's both, he, but in the wrong ways. Like, he's both, he's both, but in the way that um, is really only helpful in getting the liberals moving again, right? Because he even like he even says he sees it as the same project, organizing liberals. If we just did that, then we'd be okay. I mean, basically, one of the interesting things I, I remember all these socialists who get into Schumpeter and forget that while Schumpeter worked with Marxists in his period and flirted with the German historical school, ultimately he hated socialists. Oh yeah. Um, uh, that like that people like. Well, I remember when I was in the '90s, a lot of people were reading uh, his book on democracy and capitalism and how democracy was going to end capitalism and lead to socialism because capitalism was too had too much creative destruction i.e was too prone to crisis from the marxist standpoint like he's agreeing with marxist basically as an austrian but it's like he's upset about it he's like well okay maybe you guys are right you're going to get socialism through democratic means but what was interesting about that is like people don't realize like he's critiquing democracy fools mm -hmm. like um and he 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 actually ends up at the same position as Bernstein. And so when people try to revise uh, Bernsteinism in in the aftermath of the New Left, which was a pretty common thing, like you uh, you, you see um, Sch uh, Schumpeter and Werner Sombart, everyone's favorite former Marx Marxist turned Nazi. Um, mm -hmm be revived be revived to like argue for this evolutionist concession to like love populism basically it's like the first the first uh turns to what harringtonism becomes uh, is right. at this time period and it uses these texts to do it like but they don't what's interesting is they don't use bernstein himself because that would that's too controversial well like, because that would that would be an admission yeah right like so we're going to use sombart Oh, we're going we're gonna to use Sambar and ignore that he died a Nazi. Um, <laughs> and we're going to use, um, which doesn't mean it, it doesn't mean that his book on America is wrong. Actually, what's interesting is he's basically the first person. He doesn't use this language, but he's the first person to promote the settler colonial thesis. Is that right? Really? Yeah. Well, I he, mean, he, yeah, he's got, yeah, he does write quite a bit uh, before his right word turn that he, i think is yeah. completely he doesn't insulting. use that language i want to yeah. be clear on that like he's not a he but he is his explanation for why there is no why there's no revolution in america is that the american Ro working roast class and apple pies yeah aren't well kind of but the reason why he says that is because they're exploit they're they're extrapolating all this extra land and doing it under industrial conditions which means that there is a way in which the workers are little bourgeois people, which is which is kind of the the interesting thing is like Jay Sakai, for example, and settlers will take that, but also argue that basically um, both blacks and uh, indigenous Americans are fully fledged nations in the Stalin sense before the before any bourgeois revolution, which I think is doesn't like that doesn't make any sense, but. Mm. 
but that's kind of how you get to settlers and it's actually in Vernus right. Sombart. Um, yeah. okay. hmm. and, but that's what the, what's interesting is that text gets brought about. It's that text is translated in English in 1973. Right. Why is that? Well, we're going to do Bernsteinism again, but we're not going to call it that because that's not going to work because we just got to say, like, well, Americans will never be socialists. So if we're going to get to socialism, it's got to be through, like, liberalism and shit. So we got to play with the Democrats again. Yeah. And and again, it's also a justification of actually existing policies because, well, the CPUSA actually still did that even after the fucking Red Scare, even yeah. after Truman. They still maintain the popular front. Like, when did the CPUSA ever drop the popular front? Um, I don't even know that they've done it now. No, like, they haven't done it now. Yeah, they, they were severed from Moscow and just never changed their line. <laughs> What's <laughs> tragic about that is that, like, the popular front in the 30s and 40s was a meaningful thing that, like, you can critique, but at least it's a, it's, it is a, a position that has actual weight. Right. And then today, to not have dropped it is to is to have dropped it because essentially what it means is to be dragged behind and play a role entirely supportive of and not a partnership with the liberals. Right. right. It's tailism. Yeah. But ML tailism instead of trot tailism. <laughs> right. I mean, because well, pop frontism would be awesome compared to whatever is called pop frontism now. At least right. pop frontism we could criticize. Right. I mean, it's also like, well, you know, United Frontism, which has been ruined by its association with Trotsky, is using it as mm -hmm. an excuse to do pop frontism, but not call yeah, it I that. know. I always, <laughs> said, I always said that when I was in the ISO. I said, wait, how is this not pop frontism? I mean, it wasn't. I, I, I will be fair. To be fair, Trotskyist listeners, that's not true of all Trotskyist forms of that's United true. Frontism, but it is yeah, true, true of the largest Trotskyist forms of United Trotsky, yeah. of Frontism in, in the United States in, in Britain. So. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, and, and and a big part of that is because the workers' formations. I mean, they they don't exist. Like the a united front between communists and and other workers' formations. That's a political, um, it's a political calculation that requires the other workers' formations to exist. And so, otherwise, right. well, the only thing you can do is pop frontism. Well, but and pop frontism requires you to participate in coalition from a position of strength where you well, are right. needed. Instead of just tailing, right. right? In in every case, we're really just talking about tailing. Yes, whether yeah. it's it, it's only as at protests or else at the ballot box, it's just tailism. And yes. even if you're not tailing by being, I don't know, the DSA and technically in the Democratic Party, probably <laughs> you're you're tailing by the fact all you can do. Like if you look at some Marxist, Leninist, and Trotsky troops who don't do that, they still end up. What they do is try to tail movementism from the democratic party still right yeah um are organic things adjacent to it but are easily capitulated to the democratic party because no one has any independent imagination that isn't like the green party which is a farce anyway um and, and so it's interesting because when i talk about cold and i, I want to use this cold and warm metaphor from Ernst block to get it to the american is because in the beginning I said, well, when they come together, they're lukewarm water. But actually, mm -hmm. I think it's true, actually, in America, they've come together into lukewarm water. Mm -hmm. What is Bernieism? Is Bernieism warm or cold? Yes. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, it's... I, think, I think in in either case, whether we're talking about cold stream or warm stream, we have to first talk about Marxism. Mm -hmm. and, and Marxism is doesn't barely barely exists. So like, I'm not really sure, but I also, I'm kind of indifferent as to whether or not what we're doing, what the DSA types are doing right now is cold or warm stream. Well, I think to, it's interesting because it's a nature to me, like we're looking at this post-mortem and we, we have the hour of Minerva now. It can now take off. Right. Um, I think we can fairly say that Bernie was a response to the failure of the labor movement after Occupy, which there was a real, this is one of the, the weirdest things about the 20 teens. There was a real labor movement militancy and expansion yeah. Yeah. from 2012 to 2015. Um, I mean, it's starting probably in 2008, I think, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. it didn't really, you don't, you, you see a, you see a end of decline around 2008. Yeah. And then uh, well, actually, like, take that back. You see a you see a precipitous decline 
at the beginning of 2008 because the auto workers unions are liquidated. Right. So like they're crushed. But after that, once that's over, you see, cause there's a big drop after like the UAW scandals and all that. Mm -hmm. you know. um, but once that's over, you see a stop in the declining unionization. Like, yeah. yeah. Um, around 2012, you see a pickup in unionization. Like it actually increases. All right. Both in raw numbers and in percentage of working people. Around 2000 and to about 2018, it's been steady from like, I think uh, from the beginning of the Trump administration to about 2018. 2019 is still steady. You see a slight uptick because there's hints that we're going to start seeing a recession, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, 2020 happens, COVID happens, everything goes haywire. But at the end of that, when we come back, a ton of union jobs have been deunionized. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, green de green develop in the United States is not unionized for, by the most part. I think people don't know that. Like the Green New Year deal stuff is not union for the most part. Um, so it's not much of a new deal, then, is it? Right. Well, I mean, it might like they might have tried to make it union if they ever actually did it, but there's yeah. nothing in like the the uh, the 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 Inflation Reduction Act, which is the minimum program of the Democratic Party. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so if we look at that in in this world historic movement, Bernie happens in the context of this. What's interesting. As Occupy happens, that's really a response to the failure of the Obama administration to live up to any sort of change. And it's a very anarchistic movement because that's the form that's before. It looks like, like right. Occupy looks like the alter globalization movement with more Marxist in it, but it still looks effectively the same. And at the time, I remember saying, and I remember listening to David Graeber, and I said this, you can go back and find it in print, so you can't accuse me for making this up in hindsight. Um, you guys wouldn't, but listeners, you can find it from 2012, where I was like, this is not the beginning of a politics, the end of one. Like, and I don't know what's coming after. Then we get the DSA. The DSA, interestingly, it was not obvious at the time because even I was like, we need a clearinghouse of all these left-wing sects because there's actually left-wing movement and it's all tied up in these stupid sectarian organizations and we need a clearinghouse for them. I hope it's the IWW because it's a union, not a party and not attached to Democrats. And I was, I didn't get what I want because yeah. part of that is Bosch Garson's car's fault. And then, and, uh, uh, that is why I always call him Bashkar Arlene. But anyway. Um, I mean, I mean, but part of that is because of an organizing strategy. And the yeah. IWW just didn't have one. No, it did not. And in fact, it's shortly after this when I tried to join the IWW and couldn't because it couldn't get a shit together. Yeah. So <laughs> you, Didn't you say you couldn't get anyone to get back in touch with you? When you to were take to local dues. So I yeah. would pay the national dues. I did it twice. I paid the national dues and they couldn't get me in touch with a local person, pay the local dues and finish joining. Like for real, yeah. Um, um, it's kind of a. I mean, whatever. It's just yeah. I mean, yeah. you know. Uh, so, so, so. But anyway, that was my hope. Um, I didn't get my hope. Al Minerva, whatever. But I always felt like hey, Bernie felt like real movement and real dissatisfaction. Mm -hmm. But it also, and conversely, in retrospect, was a massive way to not do what you needed to do and in fact in, in retrospect well, yeah. it's pretty clear that we were allowing ourselves actively to be played at the time well like, right because the idea was like if bernie is the president then the organizing which we are hoping for and which we already have witnessed will continue and pick up and if not then, then it's all sunk and that means in practice that it was all sunk right well, and, and and the entire time I even pointed out that, that that was a circular logic because you needed that working class movement to exist to get Bernie into president safely yeah. to, 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 uh, to hold the party accountable or you had needed to completely have already taken over the Democratic Party. And, yeah. and, and I was like, oh, all the stuff. And I said this in 2018. I'm like, all the stuff you're doing around this is kind of cope. Like. Mm -hmm. This is not to say that Varner's always right, Varner's often wrong, but the the what is interesting about that is that seems in retrospect like a very cold movement, like we were just moving along with the with the movement oh, yeah. of history. 
but at the time it seemed like completely warm. Like yeah. it seemed totally like we have an electoral chance. We can seize this. We can make the workers movement happen by political force. Why like, yeah, was a Bonapartist voluntarism. Right. Which, yeah, the problem is that the voluntarism was not directed at the labor movement while it was actually receptive to it. Yes. And, and when it, when the DSA actually shifted to the labor movement, which is post facto, Mm-hmm. It, it shifted mostly to a to a quote like and file strategy, which by that what we actually mean is everybody becomes staffers, right? Like, and, th- and then we could justify our our historic betrayal of labor by having our spokesperson point out the fact that the unions asked us to vote against the strike. Yeah, and even though the the actual workers in the unions did not voted down the that. contract. Yeah, right. The union bosses, you know, the ones that we uh, we love so much, then we have no criticism of at all. Yeah, because that's the unions. Yeah, like that, and that's where we are, right? So, so in this moment, the warm and cold combine together into a lukewarm mor- morass of which God should spit out. Uh, well, right, <laughs> because the warm and cold should be thought of as like a hot springs versus the ocean. Like you have to jump back and forth between the two because one is too cold for too long, and then the other is too warm. But if you actually blend them together, who wants to sit in that water? <laughs> yeah, you, you're on you're on fire with your metaphors today, Jason. This is very not very not characteristic of you. <laughs> yeah, usually I'm sundowning by this point. <laughs> um, no, I'm just talking about usually with metaphors, you're they're ridiculous. Oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> I, like your I whole am, life. I am I historically awful too. at metaphors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah you, you're really on fire today with this, but. But I think this takes us back to the tensions in Marxism itself. We've talked about this in Marx. It's really there in Marx that it's not it's not just that Marx is contradicting himself. It's not really nearly, but that if you're trying to deal with things as you see them and develop a theory that approaches reality, you're going to be wrong. I think even scientists kind of know this. You're going to be wrong and have to correct. And then you're going to probably be wrong in other ways and have to correct that. And that's how this works. Well, yeah, right. uh, and at one point that was it, it was accepted as science, like to develop means to move past because of mistakes which were made in honest uh, attempts to approximate the truth. Right. The, the difference with Marxism being that it's a political is that we're also trying to change everything while we do this. Now, yes. science ends up doing that anyway. I mean, that's one of the interesting things about science. It does that. It's not it's not necessarily trying to do that, but it does do that. Like, um, so that's, you know, uh, apparently that's kind of how we think about all of this. And the difference between one of the things that makes this really hard and really hard to communicate, even from like an academic standpoint. Right. And, you know, everyone complains about academic Marxists and yes, they all suck, but also like, you don't have Marxism without academics, motherfuckers. I'm sorry. Yeah, like, let's true. be real here. Um, and the people, the the, the crypto blankiest in, in our midst who don't even know they're blankiest because they don't know their own history. And why would they? Because they're blankiest. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so, of course, they don't know what they are. Um, uh, w- would be like, well, of course, the, the Marxism. Marxism is, uh, is the last bastion of the bourgeoisie to misquote a Paul Maddox book. Because... Yeah. Uh, because it, it always came from academics and academics are bourgeois. I'm like, well, no, they're actually not. But they're anyway, I, I whatever. We're not going to get into that debate. Let's get into this other debate. Um, no one in socialism thought the socialism necessarily uh, had to be thought up by the workers preemptively because that's not how it's not like the 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 merchants aren't the people who thought up liberalism either. Like, well, and right. And also like the class struggle was an established fact. It just was happening. So based on the fact that that there's a thing that is happening, the socialists were just a a variant of, of, of an outlook for how it could conclude. That's it. So I guess this gets our, our -hmm. our problem is that uh, we are, we are left with only the conclusions, but not actually the process right now. Well, this is this is an actually interesting process. This is why so many socialists have to like focus on states and not workers' movements because they don't have a way to focus on workers' movements. Like, right? Yeah. They basically have to go like, well, the apotheosis of all of socialism is 
China and maybe Cuba and maybe the Vietnam and maybe the DPRK um, because they're it, because they can't find a movement to attach to. And then they blame, you know, Western Marxist or whatever for the lack of that a, a movement existing because they're too pure. But what they're also doing is a similar kind of thought reification. Right. Yeah. It's not dealing with the fact that, like, no, these are consequences of failure, which means that, like, we live in the barbarism of which we predicted. That doesn't mean we have to stay there. And it doesn't mean that I don't think the next I think the next battle still within the realm of the working class. But I don't know that it will stay that way because of history moving and whatnot. Right. Um, the. You know, even though we all you know, we had this whole series where we rejected the neo feudal thesis uh, yeah. there, there is a way in which the neo feudalism thesis is too optimistic about like the failure of of capitalism right um it's like you know if this is if this is neo-feudalism it's actually not so bad um, well, it's, well it's at least not different it's not so different as to be noticeable yeah i mean it was not even mass deaf yet yeah um so yeah if sea level's gonna rise a few inches first yeah actually on that the crisis of capitalism seems to be a lot like the crisis of feudalism. It seems almost identical. It's just, yeah. it's happening and it's imperceptible and like, I don't know. I At mean, some the, point, maybe something else will happen, I guess. The Marxist unique claim is we, this is our unique claim to politics. We claim that, okay, every other time past, this stuff emerges, but it emerges kind of post hoc. Right. Mm -hmm. We claim that because of capitalism's productive capacity and the collective knowledge of humanity prior, that we'd be able to like seize on this as it happens and actually direct it. That was our promise. Yeah. Um, as of yet, we have not done that in enough of the world. If you even think, and that's if you include China as a socialist country, which is, you know, a, a debate I don't want to get into today. So we're just going to assume it. Yeah. Um, we have not done that in enough of the world in, in any kind of fast enough time to actually take care of the situation. Yeah, not even close. And when people talk about, oh, we needed more productive forces to do that, I want I will always quote people because they'll quote this line and won't quote the line before it. Ingalls predicted that we had enough of productive forces for socialism in 1881, and he says it. He talks about the need for productive forces in in uh, in uh, socialism, utopian, and scientific. But he says in that book when it was published that we were already there. Right. Yeah. We, so, we we suffer from a, an excess. We suffer from a a I can't think of the word right now. Is it a, a decadence? Is yeah, it, it's a decadence. Uh, yeah, that's exactly right. Is it is it a great rotting? <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, it's it's, it's, it's like, profound. We, we the we've been rotting on the vine for a, a century. And you know what will happen if you say that even to de de to leftists and definitely to liberals, they will call us conservatives for talking about decadence at all because well, they don't it, understand what we mean. Well, in they that think sense, we mean moral decadence. Well, right. right. It, in the sense of what we're actually saying, it's I guess it's fine to be conservative. I don't mind being like that's a conservative thing, but I but that it is not a conservative position. No, like it's, it's just a it's it is a conservative outlook to, to the economic development. Because only, I mean, I don't want to say only lunatics would have positive views about economic development because some of the people who do are, uh, you know, on our side, whatever. But uh, I do not share their positive outlook. Yeah. I just yeah. don't see what, why we, I don't see what productive forces you could possibly need more of. Unless you, like. I can, like, I can think of a lot we'd need less of. Right, right. I mean, like, I'm well, just right, like, that's right. Like, again, we, like, again, <laughs> to be to be conservative, yeah, sure, we need less. Well, here's the thing. I, I, um, this is this is my this is my dropping back and forth between cold and warm stream a bit. Um, I think, for example, when we talk about growth and degrowth socialism, I wish we just fucking stop talking about it because I like. Like growth when you're not concerned with GDP and you're not concerned with like having to get rid of dead labor looks radically different 
than not. Like when I'm not trying to like keep the keep economic exchange going every second of every day, then growth can look radically different than what we mean by it. And so can non-growth look radically different. Right. It doesn't like right. your limit. That whole discussion is a discussion of current conditions extrapolate in current conditions abstractified really not even current yeah. conditions does it actually exist currently conditions on a balance sheet extra extrapolated into the future forever right well, like a, a, just like a conversation about like what's better uh apple pie or metallica it's like well it depends on what the fuck you were trying to do <laughs> yeah it's it's just like sometimes we we like some comparisons are 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 well fair it, dep it depends on what year of metallica and it depends on on who made the apple pie and also it's depends true. on whether or not you're trying to talk about music or you're talking about dessert so um, like the, with the whole growth versus degrowth thing it's it's a false dichotomy really like obviously some degrowth that's what i was to trying happen. to say obviously some degrowth needs to happen in certain areas like if if we made uh, like let's say let's say we don't even get rid of smartphones if we just made them less uh if, if we just just decommodified them, there we go. Utterly yeah, change how they work. Like, decommodify them yeah. and then make them so that they last, so that you only need one for you know 10, 15, 20 years. Whatever. Which, by the know. way, Apple already did for us. It just makes sure that it doesn't. Like, yeah, right. like yeah. they, we know for a fact that they designed software to make their prior bricks bricked because yep. because they make good products and they would last a long fucking time. I know. Like, I still got an iPhone eight, man. Like, that's what i'm using right now well yeah like like i like uh, i bought a i think it's 2002 i bought a sovtech guitar amp it was made in 1967 it had the same tubes that were manufactured in, outside like st petersburg and it sounded great and then i bought uh, new tubes by uh the modern russian company that makes this you know uses the same equipment and within one year i had to replace those tubes with the old sovtech tubes again so like degrowth doesn't mean there shouldn't be factories. It just means we should stop making stuff to not last. Right, because we know how to make stuff to last. Like, yeah. I, I have a Yamaha piano from 1971 that's actually... Like, yeah, yes, yeah. we have to replace the felt on it. And, like, yeah. occasionally you have to replace the wood. But it, but there is a sense, like, in early bourgeois culture before they realized that overproduction was a problem. Yeah. Um, you actually have these really interesting artifacts that still fucking work. Like, mm -hmm. like and work as good as any modern equivalent. Like, absolutely i like, mean like just just look at cars right right the way that they were made in the 1950s and 60s and 70s and 80s or even the 90s really and then now well man i think about like a, I have a I mean, chris knows this person too whatever we have this mutual friend and one time i was helping him move and uh it was really really tough to carry his bookcase because his bookcase was manufactured in 1791 in Paris. Oh yeah, I remember that one. Yeah. Yeah. Now, of course, any bookcase I like if I was going to go buy a bookcase like right now, even it, if it's made of wood. Like, yeah, it, it, it would maybe wood, last board. a couple of years. Yeah. And only if it only if it didn't move. But the bookcase I was talking about before that was made in 1791 in Paris. So not only did it move, it moved across the ocean and lots of lots and lots and lots of times. So like, yeah, that's how much we that's how well we could construct things based on knowledge that's like very very old based on techniques that, which are like outdated and those are cats yep for those of you watching we have a cat <laughs> we have a, a great cat interference because uh cats are anarchists and they they uh make things more complicated no um <laughs> um so <laughs> i love cats um um I Chris, you're muted. You're muted. Yeah, sorry, I had to throw out the cats because uh, they like to pee in here. <laughs> that feels. This is the only the only place that they go outside of the litter box is in my fucking office. So you just cronstatted the cats. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> yep. Until we figure out how to get them to stop peeing in here, they're not allowed. <laughs> they're kittens. They'll grow out of it. Hopefully, yeah. Just uh, like the cronstat sailors. Uh, yeah, well, exactly. some of them, um, oh, yeah. but anyway, um, the, 
I guess this is a good way to pivot to our next episode. It's going to be a joint episode. It's not a no road road episode. For those of you who want to know what we're doing on no road road, we're going back into f- feudal class relations. Hell yeah. With uh, yeah. Rodney Hill. Am I correct? Rodney Hill. Yeah. Feudalism Hilton. proper. Yeah. yeah. Yep. We're um, talking about the transition from feudalism to capitalism this time. Instead of last time, What we when we talked about feudalism proper, we were talking about the transition from the ancient mode of production to feudalism. Yeah, uh, the ancient mode of production to the feudalistic mode of production. We should actually like be pretty clear. There's more than one. Oh, um, absolutely, and and also that transition was like a centuries long process. Yeah, uh, but centuries. It's like six. I think it's like all the dark ages basically, which wasn't, which weren't actually that dark. I will also add just to make all my modern scholars happier. Uh, it's, it's enlightenment propaganda, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean it is, but also no, like we, but it's also dark in the sense that we don't have a lot of, uh, of text. Yeah. Well, we have a lot of text; they're just not that useful. It's, right. They're all like religious text. And then one of the things that I'm figuring out about Hilton, oh, you know what? I'll save this for next time. Sorry. Yeah, yeah but yeah. We, we, uh, Hilton will be what we're doing next. Uh, yeah. No Royal Road, but we have a we have a sequel to the Worm and Cold Streams called "Let's Finally Talk About Decadence." Yes, let's do um, it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Why are it. both these streams heading into the the Marianas Trench? Why? Like, <laughs> um, like... the, the streams have combined and uh, stopped the jet stream from circulating. Yeah, yeah. Wait, and that makes for a stagnant pool that like yeah. mosquitoes hatch in, and yeah, mosquitoes well, hatch in, and 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 it makes climate change worse. If there's yeah. no oxygen, so there's a mass die off of. Uh, <laughs> organisms in the area <laughs> um, and that's the reason why we have to talk about decadence yeah Just... we have to talk about decadence because because uh i think i i think in both the broad sense and the micro sense mm-hmm. uh, there, there's a tendency amongst like old leftists to go, well, you're just complaining about the death of bourgeois radicalism. I'm like, you know, it's easy to accuse the DSA of being bourgeois radicalism. Right. But I don't think that's true. I think it, I, I actually do think it was a sincere attempt to form some kind of workers politics that couldn't and one of the ironies about right now and i I pointed this back at people i'm like you guys talk about how the workers movement's more dead than ever before and you're right but you have to square that with the fact that the condition of work is actually more universalized than it's ever been right and that that actually is the hardest thing i mean that's like the the, you want to talk about these anomalies in marxism that's something no one saw Mm-hmm. No one saw that. No one predicted that the, that the near universalization of at least part of proletarian status would actually reduce class conflict, or at least and, make it one way. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, like, and thus class consciousness, and the, and thus you know, right, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. And I, I think the only way we can explain that, um, in any in anything like anything that even attempts to still be Marxian is a kind of decadence theory that tries to be fair to Marx, but also honest with the current condition. Mm. And I also think that means we're going to have to say some things that's going to make some people uncomfortable because it is not clear to me that we can voluntaristically bring back the workers' movement the way that like many social Democrats or even ML think they're able to do. I mean, uh, I'll, right. I'll go as far as to say, again, I'm going to just prefiguring what we're going to talk about when we do that is a... I don't think we can. I think for even in terms of unionization, when I keep on pointing out to people, yes, even, there's new unions in the service sector and it's great. And service sector employees need to be unionized. It's fundamentally different from industrial unions. Yeah. Right. Um, it's entire relation. Like, look, if it, I, I hate to tell you, but if Starbucks copy went away tomorrow and there was, and even all its competitors went away tomorrow, capitalism doesn't stop. Right. Still make coffee at home. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Like, ha- rather than respond to that, I'm just, I'm also going to save that thought because I just. Right. So trying, to not open, I'm trying to not open up more conversations, but yeah. But yeah. We're, yeah, yeah. I know we're already at like two hours on this. this yeah. On this this is the Varn stream, which is actually the, this is the average length of a Varn podcast. Oh yeah. Um, oh, this uh, is usually how long we record, but I think that when, whenever I put out episodes, they're like an hour and a half tops. Yeah. We yeah. usually cut them down. 
Yeah. I don't see Varn does not does not believe in editing anything more than obvious floops. So yeah. Um, so I, I think we should end up. I think this has kind of been a wider range. I think we can look at the warm and cold stream and look at political and economic political. I, I, here's how I want to set this up. We can't say the warm and cold stream is either scientific or a romantic Marxism exactly. We also can't say that it's political determinism of volunteerism and economism either. Right. There are warm and cold elements to both. And what we mean by that is that there are some elements that see this stuff as something you can bring about. And I guess the, I guess warm stream is more voluntaristic. I will say that. Yes. Um, and cold stream is more deterministic. But in the final instance of both these things, if we were to look at a tendency and say this is mostly voluntaristic, as we said in the beginning, they tend to flip on themselves in a moment of defeat and become deterministic. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, which is a pretty good cope uh, as far as it goes, but also like we're real good at cope as Marxists. Right. I mean, I think Otto Bauer gave us a pretty good language for exactly what kind of socialist we should be. Yeah. And it, it relates to the dichotomy between revolutionary and reformists. But in this case, I think it also relates to the dichotomy between warm and cold streams. And that's to be integrated or to use Lenin's language is to uh, be as radical as reality itself. And I think that's a good note to end on, even though I think that also means we haven't answered the question as to what that is. But um, not, not not yet. Yeah, we're, um, we're going to go with a literary uh, criticism approach to this. And uh, it's up to your interpretation. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I'm going to go with the our Minerva thing. We'll, we'll know what yeah. it, we'll know what it is when when you have a socialist society that lasts more than 100 years. Yeah. Um, right. And uh, actually spreads without, you know, killing off large portions of its population. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, I think I think I'm I'm comfortable with that too. It's like, Al Minerva. That's my yeah. uh, that's my response. It just and if it never happens, it never on. happens. I mean, I, I think the one thing I do have to tell Marxists, and this will be my final thought, and maybe this will be another part of the decanist theory. We do have to actually try to maintain the null hypothesis, and the null hypothesis is that. Well, there's a bunch of them. There's actually more than one about this. But but at the basic level, socialists lost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. And, 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 and uh, there's an optimistic socialist loss. Well, we have China still, and maybe that'll save us. That that is that's a, that's a socialist loss narrative, guys. I don't think people mm -hmm. realize that, but it is. Um, and then the, the 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 other one is like, well, the 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 time horizon for where socialism is long past. Like, which I don't believe, but I do think we have to entertain it. Like we have to see, it can't be something that we will not even ask. Right. Um, uh, I don't think it's historical nihilism to ask it either because it, it's one of these things like, well, are we wasting our time? I think no, but we have to be able to really look at it because, uh, if I look at contemporary evidence, it, we look like a weird subculture. Yeah, that's what we look like. We look we like really punk rockers in the eighties. Well, like, well, well, we are a weird subculture. Yes. The question is only, do we have to remain one? And so far, it seems as though the answer is yes. But yeah. also, but also maybe no. And on and on that, <laughs> we shall play them credits. <laughs>